much we understand God's love for us and others through the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross is in forgiveness. You know, I've been covering a series uh, on God. So in this topic, uh, the glory of forgiveness, I will bring in the aspect of God's character of love. Okay, 1 John uh, chapter 4 verse 8, 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 tells us that love is the essence of God's divine nature. Uh, because John chapter 4, uh, 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 says that God is love. That's the essence of the very nature of God. So there are four, ex four expressions of God's love. Four expressions. And the first one is grace. We hear a lot about grace. But I want, I want you to um, um, really consider the grace that, um, that God sees it as it is, you know, because there are all kinds of teaching about grace today. Um, it's not quite complete, but I'm not saying I have the complete thing, um, but I'm saying that we need to understand grace as the way God intends it to be. So in the Old Testament, we don't actually see the word grace, but we see the expression of God as merciful and gracious. So that was grace in the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, the word grace, the word grace is especially connected with the manner of Christ's life and his sacrificial death. I want you to see the connection of grace here, okay? Because that's very important for our, how we look at grace. So the word grace in the New Testament is connected especially with the manner of Christ's life and his sacrificial death. Here is the highlights the, this is where it highlights the aspect of God's love as self-giving regardless of merit. That is that kind of love. So forgiveness for the person who wrongs you has this important aspect of self-giving to the person who wrongs you regardless of merit. Do you see the connection of grace here? with forgiveness. Now, the next expression of God's love is mercy. Mercy embodies itself, especially with compassion, long-suffering, and forgiveness. In mercy, God remembers his covenant with us. I want to pause there because I need you to, to, to understand where God is coming from when he shows us mercy. It's because he remembers his covenant with his people. He remembered the covenant with Abraham. He remembered the covenant with Isaac and Jacob. And that's why there's always a remnant. He's merciful. In his faithfulness, he shows us mercy. So he's faithful to God's people based on his covenant with his people. His faithfulness, sh he shows us mercy even when we are disobedient and unfaithful to him. Can we say thank you, Jesus? Forgiveness for the person who wrongs you has this particular aspect of long-suffering. Because long-suffering and mercy goes together. The next expression of God's love is loving kindness. This particular relate to God entering into his covenant, his people. We're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse uh, 9. Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So it's very interesting that today Bill chose that um, 
uh, reading from Deuteronomy chapter 28, if we are willing and obedient, all that is tied to his covenant with us. So this loving kindness is the steadfast love of God, unshakable. So it's interesting that Gordon chose that song, you know, unshakable God, enduring for a thousand generations. Wow. Wow. For those who love him and obey him. There's always, we always think that God does not, you know, God's love is unconditional. Just because we think that God's love is unconditional, there are many things. There are conditions to his blessings. God's love is unconditional, but there is a condition to enjoy his blessings. There's a difference there. Amen? So it is for those who love him and obey his commandments that his, his loving kindness, you know, will go on for thousands of generations. Notice that love for God is always reciprocated with obedience to him. Now, when we think of obedience, we always think it's a work. But actually, obedience, I found out, is not work. Because I realized it is a love response to him. The more I love him, the more he tells me to do something, it, it, it doesn't become work anymore because I enjoy it. It becomes part of me to love my God back. It is a nature developed by the Holy Spirit on the inside of a believer, the obedience you know, um, to God's love. The gift of the Holy Spirit is... Sorry. Gift of the Holy Spirit, which is God's Spirit Himself, is the grace of God for us. So God's God gave us His Spirit, and that is His grace to us. It's unmerited. We don't deserve His Spirit. God is holy. God is immense. God is so um, powerful. Everything, but He gave us His Spirit as His grace for us, so that we may know Him. So that His Spirit will enable us to respond in obedience, in love. Otherwise, we can't because of our human nature that have sinned. So God, in his grace, gave us his spirit. I hope you grasp that because it is so powerful once we understand that the gift of the Holy Spirit is God's grace for us so that the grace of God, you know, the spirit of God within us, can accomplish what he intends uh, for us to accomplish. And so the blessings come full, come start flowing. It's all connected. Forgiveness for the person who wrongs you has this aspect of loving kindness. The next expression, the last one, uh, is goodness. Okay, Out of his innate goodness flows benevolent, ben I can't say that word, Benevolence to ben benevolence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we get all this, um, all the, the different languages I have up here, so sometimes I just can't say it quite right. <laughs> um, to all creation, Jesus is the good shepherd. Okay, he, you know, in John chapter 10, he talks about Jesus as the good shepherd. The goodness of God, regardless of any circumstances that may seem evil will prevail for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So again, you see there is that part of that we need to respond to God, to love him and to be called according to his purpose. And the exciting thing here is that he gives us his spirit to be able to love him and to do according to his purpose. Hallelujah. So um, that what that um, that is from Romans chapter 8, verse 28, if you're taking notes. Um, forgiveness for the person who wrongs you has this aspect of pouring out goodness in spite of the difficult circumstance. Hmm. You know, when God taught me about forgiveness, and I'm thinking, whoa, I have no idea what forgiveness is. 
Because forgiveness of God is really the expression of all these this four things in God, you know, the grace, the mercy, showing grace, showing mercy, showing loving kindness, showing goodness. That is the power of forgiveness, the glory of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was kind of hard for me to do this, um, you know, put it all like it's flowing, you know, <laughs> because there's so many angles. So I'm going to just give you a um, few, few um, subtitles, you know, to, to um, teach uh, more in depth about forgiveness. So manifestation, the first uh, subtitle I gave here is Manis Manifestation of the Loving of Kindness of God in Forgiveness. And we're going to read Hosea chapter 9. Uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. Hosea, you know, um, you know, in, in, a, in, in the uh, Chinese dialect that uh, we know, you know, they used to tease when we say uh, Hosea. So they don't say it, Hosea. They say Jose. Jose means it's really good. Everything is fine. <laughs> that's, so that's not... <laughs> huh? Hosea it's, it's, uh, chapter 2, 19 to 20. Did I miss the joke there? <laughs> oh, in Chinese. Oh, uh, in that particular language, um, we say Jose means everything's good. That's the meaning. Yeah, so... So that's why when, when, we, when we have all this different, you know, way of saying things, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I say it wrong. Anyway, Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 to 20, it says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. So when we entered into the covenant with Jesus Christ, I mean, with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, we, he entered with us, okay, into this covenant in righteousness, in justice, in loving kindness, mercy, and faithfulness. All of that, he entered into this covenant with us. Hallelujah. The book of uh, Hosea speaks of a one-sided love and faithfulness relationship. That's hard. When you have a broken relationship with somebody... It always feels like it's one-sided. If we are truly honest with ourselves, many times our relationship with God is one-sided too. You see, he loves us deeply. He shows faithfulness to us even when we are unfaithful. So, you know, it... <laughs> This book was so hard for me to, you know, to understand God, you know, in the beginning, uh, you know, early, early when I just became born again, you know, I could not understand how this God could do such a thing, you know, instruct, you know, instruct Hosea to marry Goma. And you all know what Goma is like. So his marriage and domestic life actually illustrated a very um, tragic um, you know, situation of God's unfaithfulness, uh, God, no, the unfaithfulness of God's people. So, Hosea went through very painful experience. Very, very painful experience. But in that, he could sense, he could um, sense the sorrow over the sinfulness of God's people. It was very painful. The people in Hosea is described as they were bent on backsliding. Now, it's one thing that you drift away and backslide, but to purposely backslide, deliberately backslide, that is even more serious. So that was the people that God described, his own people. Are we the same today? As God's people, I, I shudder to think. Sometimes I think about my life. I have to keep evaluating my life to see whether I am deliberately at times 
backsliding. You know, um, I was, you know, I think Smith Wigglesworth said this. It was, it's a very strong word he said. He says the, mo the moment we, we, we don't change, the moment we become stagnant, we have backslided. That's a very, very strong word. But it is a good um, word I receive for myself because it keeps me in check to be consistently moving from strength to strength, to be consistently uh, letting God take me from glory to glory, and that I will not be in a place of stagnancy, that I will not be a place where I will start drifting away. For me, for me, it's a very powerful word, and I, I have held on to that because I don't want to, to respond to God's love by doing that, because he has done so much for us. So Hosea's loyal love for Goma reflects God's long-suffering, forgiveness, and steadfast loving kindness of Israel. Forgiveness, to forgive someone, there is a lot of pain, definitely, definitely. But that is long-suffering. That's long-suffering. That is that first love of God. God does not violate his own nature, his character. So when he said he betrothed his people forever, he said, he specifically said betroth his people forever. So he betrothed his people in righteousness, justice, loving kindness, mercy, and faithfulness. And he did exactly that. He did not move from that promise. Even when he had to bring judgment, okay, he has done it throughout history. He's brought judgment, but he always did it in righteousness, justice, loving kindness, mercy, and faithfulness, even though we don't understand how. Why does he do that? So that he can bring his people back to him again. And so that the people will enjoy the life, the abundant life and the blessing that he so wants to pour out. In fact, this morning, you know, I was um, in, in the teaching on Proverbs. I was mentioning, you know, when God looks at us early in the morning, he gets so excited. You know, he looks at, you know, uh, Vanita. Oh, Vanita is up and he, she's so excited. Now, Vanita is such a precious child to him, and he gets excited. And that's the way God is with us. Regardless of how we feel, sometimes we don't feel like we want to rejoice and celebrate God, but God is always rejoicing and celebrating us. When I, go, I, when I let a hold of that idea, I said, man, why, do, why, why is it necessary to be even sad when God is so happy with us? It's sometimes we forget that when he created us in our mother's womb and put us there, he didn't say bye, you know, you take care of yourself. But he's always watching us grow like a little baby. He watches us grow. That's how much God's eyes is upon us. Hallelujah. So why am I telling you about all this love thing? It's because in forgiveness, in forgiving a person who has wronged you, it takes that kind of love. And, and many times we say, Lord, it is so hard. It's so hard because we don't understand the depth of God's love for us and for others. And we don't understand that the, he has given us his spirit to enable us to do so. Hallelujah. Long suffering and love and kindness goes hand in hand. Long-suffering and loving-kindness goes hand in hand. When a person wrongs you again and again, these are the nature the Holy Spirit is, you know, has to develop in you in order for you to forgive from the heart. You know, not just one time, but 70 times 7, you know. Um, that doesn't mean like, I don't know, 70 times 7, how much is that? 49. Huh? 49. 499. It doesn't mean that after you've forgiven that person 490 times, that's it. 
<laughs> it's just a descriptive term that means, you know, you keep doing it. True forgiveness from the heart is not characterized by the torment of the mind. If you are still tormented in the mind about somebody, you have not forgiven that person. If you have this anguish in your heart, you know, every time you see or think about that person who wronged you, you have not forgiven that person. So oftentimes we find it so hard, so hard. Why it's so hard? Because we are trying to forgive somebody in our own strength. And God never intended for us to forgive somebody in our own strength. And that's why he gave us his spirit. Because only his spirit will have that kind of love to forgive the person who wrongs you. And we see that in Jesus. That's why when Jesus died on the cross, it was a powerful thing. He died for his enemies. He died for his enemies. Only God could have done that. That's why he sent us his spirit. Precious, precious Holy Spirit. Sometimes we, we continue to cry, how long, Lord? I cannot take it anymore. It's too much for me. And this is what I've learned in, my, in the process of God teaching me about forgiveness. He says, as long as it takes you to experience my glory in the development, through the development and maturity of the fruit of loving kindness and long-suffering. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But I realized all fruits take time to develop to maturity. So does the fruit of the Spirit. So I want to stress again that God gave us His Spirit. And His Spirit in, in, um, in the Spirit of God, you have, He has love, okay? If you know the, the nine fruits of the Spirit, you know that there is love, there is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. So because the, the, the Spirit of God has all this inside him, he's able to help us produce it. But it takes time. Why? Because our carnal nature still wants to fight. We still want to, to hold on to some of these things. In fact, in fact, sometimes I, there is this, I don't know, is it perversion or something? Sometimes we just want to be angry because it feels good to be angry. You have hurt me. I'm going to stay a little while and stay there and get angry. No, no, no. We sometimes enjoy it. And that's why the Holy Spirit has to take time to deal with us. If we say, okay, I've sinned, you know, I've sinned. Uh, this is not the way I think, I should think. Then the Holy Spirit has an immediate access instead of having to wait for you. Because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. If you don't want it, he's not going to force himself on you. So the, how fast the process we go through to bear the fruit of long suffering and kindness depends on our, our willingness to yield to Him. So both um, Jesus and Hosea walked in the same steadfast love of God, long suffering and loving kindness. Hosea, I mean, he's amazing. The wife keeps running away. He keeps taking her back. And the same with God. We keep running away from God and he keeps bringing us back to him. <laughs> it's so good. So both Jesus and Hosea manifested the long-suffering and loving kindness of God. And thus, they were able to walk in a forgiveness that God has shown the next subtitle I want to, uh, you know, um, bring up is experiencing the glory of the risen Lord in forgiveness. Experiencing the glory of the risen Lord in forgiveness. Hebrews chapter 2, verse uh, 9 to 10. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. Chapter 
2, verse 9 to 10. Okay. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him who, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of, the, of their salvation perfect through suffering. Okay, that's a, that's a lot of deep truths inside of that, but I just want to bring one point out from there. Jesus suffered dead, death, but he was crowned with glory and honor. Every time we die to self, there is that glory and honor being released by God into our lives. What was the purpose of Jesus' love, sufferings, and death? Now, I, I was so excited. She says in, in that verse, verse 10, it says, because he wants to bring many sons like us, like you and me, to glory. So that's the purpose. Let's look at First Peter chapter four, verse twelve. First Peter chapter four, verse twelve to seventeen. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly, exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let them glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So from this passage here, I want to point out a few uh, different things. Now, I want to connect the pain of being wronged by someone with the anguish of knowing we have to, be, you know, as believers to forgive, but we find it hard to forgive. So that's the connection I want you to, um, yeah, um, to, to consider. So the first thing from this, this passage I want to bring out is that we must not think it is strange and, and be surprised by all these fiery trials. We live in a fallen world. Even believers are still being transformed and have not reached full maturity in love. So we shouldn't be surprised when we get hurt even by believers. <laughs> Second point I want to bring up. When you suffer for Christ's sake, or when you suffer in Christ, you partake of Christ's suffering. That's the glory. In fact, we are asked to rejoice. You see that? Verse 13. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Why? <laughs> why, did, why did Paul say that we need to rejoice to the extent, you know, we partake of Christ's suffering? As from uh, what we read earlier, Christ's glory will be revealed, okay? So Christ will bring many of us, meaning believers, to glory. 
You see, many times we want to see God's glory in His brilliance. But you see, God not only wants us to see His glory, He wants us to experience His glory. This experience comes only by partaking in Christ's suffering. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Why do you think that the heroes in Hebrews 11 inspire us? Why? It's because we see the glory of God in their obedience when it's so inconvenient. We see the glory of God in their sufferings and even in martyrdom. The glory. When I saw God's glory this way, I thought, oh, oh, man. <laughs> We've only seen God's glory in a certain angle. Fourth point, if we have not suffered because of our sin, as those listed there in, in verse 15, as a murderer, okay, Jesus said in a, in a gospel, you know, you don't actually murder somebody, but if you, you are having thoughts against a person, it's almost equivalent to murder, okay? And if you're not a thief, you're not an evildoer or busybody in people's matter, um, you know, busybody, I'm inclined to gossip, to slander, you know? And, uh, and, and in Proverbs, it talks about such people that they separate brethren and close friends. That's a serious matter. So if you have not suffered any of those, uh, you know, because of any of those, then we don't have to be ashamed of our sufferings. Sometimes when we suffer, people who don't understand what God is doing in our lives, they are very unkind with what they say. Oh, I think sh sh he's sinning against God. Oh, I think sh he, she is sinning against God. But how do we know? So we don't have to be ashamed. If we have not seen in those areas, it doesn't matter what people say about us. We have not seen. It's just God doing something in our lives for his glory. So in fact, that verse says, in verse 15, he says, you don't have to be ashamed. Uh, uh, no, verse 16, he says, but let him glory God, glorify God in this matter. That's hard <laughs> to glorify when you're suffering. But we, but that's what God, what Paul was trying to tell us. It's a glorious thing. It's a glorious thing. So glorify God. We don't just glorify God in praise, you know, but we, we glorify God in the way we live our lives, even while we are suffering. That's long suffering. Fifth point, Jesus was obedient unto death. He suffered all the way to Calvary, and God was pleased to exalt him and to crown him with glory and honor. When we partake of Christ's suffering, we experience the glory of the risen Lord. Partaking of Christ's sufferings means that it's doing God's ways, okay? And not taking things into our own, own hands. Sometimes when, we, when somebody has wronged us, we want to take things into our own, wrong, our, our own hands. But that's not the way of God. Don't do it. I've done it too many times. And it gets worse, really. It gets worse. Why? Because we don't know the, the, the right way, you know? It involves, you know, what we have to do is we, we stop defending ourselves and let God defend us. The more you defend yourself, the more you, you fumble. Because you are not fighting against flesh and blood. It's principalities. And they've been around for a long time. They sure know what else to, to hit you with. Let God defend you. Jesus was silent in Isaiah. Isaiah 53 is also a very powerful um, chapter for me because it talks about his relationship with God, you know, and how he responded to people and how he was submitted to God. You see, in Isaiah 53, it says that he was like a lamb led away to be slaughtered. He was silent. 
Most of the time at the hands of his enemies. He didn't say anything. He didn't defend himself. He had all authority and power. He could use it, but he was humble. You know, many times we cry out to see God's glory, but I think perhaps sometimes we miss seeing his glory. Why? Because we are so focused on seeing the brilliance of his glory, but we don't see the necessity of experiencing his glory through the partaking of Christ's suffering. So I realize that everything, because God is sovereign, everything I go through, if it's so, so much is suffering, and it is not because I've sinned against God, that God is trying to help me experience the glory of the risen Lord. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 12, it gives a very detailed account of how Jesus was broken for us that we might be made whole. You know, nobody can make us whole, only Jesus. When somebody wrongs us, it causes something to be broken inside of us, our being. So that's why we need healing and mending for that brokenness to be mended. Only Jesus is able to mend our broken hearts. Only Jesus, because he was so broken. He was broken so that he can make us whole, body, soul, and spirit. Not just one part, but our whole being. Jesus was broken to diffuse the glory of God into our broken lives. Wow. I want you to see this picture about, you know, that... Um, the woman that came in um, with the alabaster jar. Okay, that alabaster jar has to be broken before the fragrance in the jar could fill the whole place. So you see, when Jesus was broken, he began to refuse the glory of God into our broken lives if we accept it. Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, you know, tells us that God dwells with those who have a contrite and broken or humble spirit. Where God dwells, there we will not only see his glory, but experience his glory because he's living inside of us. Someone may have wronged us, but if we choose to bring our brokenness and dwell in God's presence, instead of dwelling on that hurt and festering anger towards that person, God's spirit, God's spirit will enable you to develop the fruit of long-suffering and loving kindness so that eventually we will be able to forgive from the heart. So in this position that you are partaking of Christ's suffering, you will experience the glory of the risen Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The next title I want to um, bring here is Receiving the Liberty of Christ on the Inside in Forgiveness. Receiving the Liberty of Christ on the Inside in Forgiveness. Okay, John chapter 14, verse 6, you all know this verse. It says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So the way to entering into forgiveness is found in who? It's Jesus because he's the way. He is the way that leads to forgiveness because Jesus is also the truth. John chapter 8, verse 32 says this. Um, part of it says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in order to find liberty in forgiveness, you also find it in Christ, not, every, not any other thing. The true liberty of freedom starts on the inside. It starts on the inside. A person who is unable to forgive is in bondage of an offended spirit. An offense is not simply just an offense. 
especially when there is a strong hold on you and you are unable to forgive and you are tormented in your mind. It is more than just a simple offense. There's a spirit inside of it. That's why Jesus is the only way. I'll explain that a little bit more later. So when you have this demonic influence of offense, it will hinder you to forgive. And that is precisely what I was talking about earlier. You are not fighting against flesh and blood because there's these principalities involved. So I'm going to um, bring in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 to show you why we need Jesus in this matter. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Seventeen. Okay, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah! So, because of that, because that Jesus is Spirit, He is able to pervade the spirit of offense, hindering you or holding you as hostage, holding your spirit, holding your soul as hostage. So Jesus as spirit can pervade into it and set you free from the bondage and its torment. So we have to choose. Like I mentioned earlier, we, we have to choose the way of Jesus. We can't do it our way. We cannot do it by human way. We have to do it God's way. So it means again, um, you know, um, and just to bring it up again, it means choosing to bring our brokenness, when somebody has offended us, have wronged us, we need to bring our brokenness, our pain, and dwell in the presence of God instead of dwelling on our hurts in our minds and festering anger. It is a discipline. We need to come into the presence of God because in the presence of God, then the Holy, then Jesus can, Jesus through the Holy Spirit can work in us. So the the Spirit of God then will be able to take to to, to begin to work in your heart to circumcise your heart. Circumcision is painful, but that's what He's doing in us when we bring our brokenness to Him and said. I will do it your way, Lord Jesus, your way and your way alone. And his way many times involves a circumcision of the heart because the law is not like outside now. He's putting the law inside of us and we need circumcision. So in this position, you are choosing Jesus as the way and the truth that leads to freedom on the inside. So any other way will not bring you true and lasting freedom on the inside. That's why, you know, when, when, um, when there are strained relationships, when the forgiveness is on, you know, not from the inside, it, you know, you will still have the same feelings later on. Something else will crop up and you say, see, you did it again. <laughs> and then you get upset. But if forgiveness, that thing has been already circumcised. You have been circumcised in your heart. The fruit of wrong, long suffering and, and loving kindness has been, you know, developed in your heart of maturity. When a person hurts you again, you don't say, there, you did again. It's over because you already have been inside of you, that loving kindness and long suffering of God. That's, that's, that's why, you know, um, when when God was telling me different things about loving again and again, it was hard, but now I understood. When I have gone under his operation table. <laughs> and now, when the same person hurts me again, it don't bother me no more. Because that long-suffering and loving kindness, God has already, his gift of the Holy Spirit, have you know matured in many ways of course then they will have god will you know i always say now i'm in a refining process you know you know the, the time where he takes you as a, a, a you know a clay you know and then he 
He throws you down, picks you up, again, shape you. But it seems like he, I'm in this point of my, 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 my walk with God is the refining process where he's already cuffs this, made this, um, uh, this shape, you know, of a vase, but he's carving out details in my life. And it's still painful because you go through the fire again and again and again. So I don't know. What state are you, regardless whether you are still the clay or you're still in the refining process, it is still painful. It is still painful. But stay there because the glory of the risen Lord you will experience. Um, where am I? Okay, I, I, I wanted to bring an uh, illustration from Matthew chapter 18, uh, 27 to 35. Okay, I'm good for time. Matthew, this is a parable about that the king and that uh, particular servant. Okay, I, I think I won't read all of it, but if you want to, you may while I'm, I'm, I'm teaching it. The servant in the parable, 18, uh, yeah, Matthew 18, 27 to, oh, oh yeah, yeah, 23 to, goes all the way, but I'm just pick, picking up a few things here. Okay. So, so this, this servant had, you know, owed the, the king a lot of money. So it's a lot of money. But, you know, the king forgave him. But you see, the moment this servant went out, he found a servant who owes him so much little, you know, very little. And he could not forgive the servant. In fact, he threw him in, in jail. And so this, this man, you know, just showed that this servant that was forgiven by the king was freed outwardly of a great dead, but he was not freed on the inside because how do we know? Because he did not understand the loving kindness of the king. And so he wasn't changed on the inside. When we understand the loving kindness of God towards us and how much he has forgiven us, then when a brother has wronged us, anybody who has wronged us, that forgiveness if we understand the loving kindness of God, we will be able to show it to another person. So instead, he held unforgiveness because he did not understand the loving kindness of the king and had no fruit of long suffering and loving kindness to offer the other servant. So an offended person cannot, who cannot forgive is not free on the inside. So if you can't forgive, there's something on the inside that God wants to work on. So if he or she is a believer, they do not know the depth of the loving kindness of God and the freedom that Christ has bought for them on the inside. We are born again of the Spirit of God. It's inside job. Well, that's not quite a good, good term to, to use, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, Isaiah chapter 55. Uh, sorry, I keep going back there. Um, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 4 and 5. shows what Jesus went through to purchase our freedom. It says here, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, when we look at these verses, we usually associate it of what Jesus has done for us. But I want you to consider this aspect. Now, every sin that a person has done to us has been borne by Jesus too. So many times when a person wrong, we cry out for justice. We want God to, to revenge on our behalf. You know? <laughs> and then when a God began to show me, you know, in for, you know, teaching me about forgiveness about this, I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute here. Here is a picture of Jesus, you know, taking the place of the one who wronged me. He was so afflicted so that I could receive the justice 
that the person has done wrong. You know, I want God to avenge me, but you see here, it pleased God to bruise him, to bruise Jesus on behalf of the person who wronged us. Do you see how much God has loved us? So in, this, in that respect, you are avenged. So the question here, you know, that, you know, this is questions that God has actually asked me. So I'm going to, you know, ask you. How much more justice and revenge do you need for the person who wronged you? after what Jesus has done on the cross for you, for that person? How much more? Is the suffering of Jesus not enough for us? The suffering that, that Jesus has, has you know, done in the place of the person who wronged us, is it not enough for us? Are the stripes of Jesus, are the stripes on Jesus' back not enough to satisfy us? Are the nails on his hands and his feet not enough for us? Is the blood of Jesus that he shared not enough for us? Jesus paid in full the sin and the wrong that was done to us. Jesus. It satisfied God the Father. Does it not satisfy our lust for vengeance and justice? If it satisfies God, let that be enough for us. Let it be enough for us. Jesus took every wrong that a person has done to us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. That's the glory in forgiveness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I pray that this revelation sing more and more because every one of us, none of us has been spared the pain of having to forgive somebody who wronged us not one time, but again and again and again. The, la the true lasting liberty, as I said, comes, start from the inside. And we find it only in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. The liberty we have on the inside is a picture of the glory of the risen Lord. The next subtitle. Uh, that's a lot of teaching. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, w I want you to be blessed that, you know, from then, from the day onwards, I want you to know liberty and experience the glory of God in this forgiveness. Amen. Isaiah, uh, sorry, uh, experiencing newness of life in reconciliation. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Uh, so, yeah, correct. Um, Romans chapter 5, verse 10 to 11. Romans 5, 10 to 11. For if we, when we were yet enemies, were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And I want you to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16. Ephesians 2, verse 16. Um, it says here that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. You see, unforgiveness is wrapped in death because it brings separations, 
separation and darkness. Sin brought separation, not only between us and God, but one another. Sin always brings darkness. And when we, and, and, and you see, if we have unforgiveness, there's darkness. And when there's darkness, we cannot see things of God very clearly. Why? Because death, we are enshrouded in darkness and death. And we can't see. We can only see when there's light and the light of Jesus Christ. Now, but when we forgive, death and darkness no longer has a hold on us. With reconciliation, we are no longer separated. Then there is light. No more walking in darkness that leads to death because the veil has been taken off our spiritual eyes. So that's why it's important for us to let the Holy Spirit work in us so that this unforgiveness will not veil us from the things that God wants us to see. Because many times we can't see the revelation of God because there is that veil. Now, in a position when you are able to forgive from your heart, then that is time you, you are ready to can reconcile. Many times we, we go, you know, I think I've just learned this. He said, don't, don't, you know, don't let the cart go before the horses. You know, I never knew that for a long time. I didn't quite know what it was until that day. <laughs> what is that? You know, I think Bill explained to me. Um, so many times we want to reconcile before God has done something in our lives. And that's why it's important to, to dwell in the presence of God. Let God do what is inside of us first. And then the Spirit of God will help you to be ready. You see, if people who have wronged you, you know, when you are ready, but you, you know, the Spirit of God has prepared you to be ready to reconcile, and you go to a person who have wronged you, and you, and you choose to reconcile, then there is newness in that relationship. That's why the subtitle says that, you know, um, experiencing newness of life in reconciliation. But if the, pers the people that have wronged you choose not to be reconciled, yet because you are free on the inside, you are able to move on regardless. Hallelujah. You are able to move on because you have the newness of life in you and the glory of the risen Lord is now, you know, you are now experiencing. You don't have to be ma manipulated by that spirit of offense in another person anymore because you have chosen the way of the Lord and the Lord has set you free. Hey, hallelujah. Because all this thing that, that the enemy wants you to feel is just manipulation of the spirit of offense. But if, if you're already done, he's done the work inside of you, you don't have to, do, to be manipulated anymore. You have been set free. And this is what you can say because you, s you see the enemy will always try again and again. You see, like, you know, um, in the temptation of Jesus, he said that he left for a while because he come back again. And that's what the enemy will do. He'll try and come back again. And what do you say? This is what I say. Devil, I have been set free by Jesus from the spirit of offense and you have no right over me anymore. And you keep saying that and saying that until he leaves. And then he will try again, and then you do the same thing. <laughs> so the one who chooses not to be reconciled will continue to be enshrouded with growing death, darkness, and separation. That's a warning for us. So eventually... When that person continue to have this growing death and darkness and separation because of unforgiveness, then they will be tormented by the devil. You see in Matthew chapter, um, that, that Matthew 18, 34, 35, you know, we read earlier. I mean, we didn't, uh, I referred earlier. At that last part, maybe let's go there because it's a 18, uh, verse 35 and verse 34 and 35. Yeah, I think that last part is very powerful. It was very powerful for me, so I want to share that with you. Um, okay, 34. And his master was angry and delivered him 
to the torturers until he should pay all that was due. So my heavenly father also will do to each one of you from his heart, if from his heart he does not forgive his brother, his trespasses. So what the, the torturers here is like in the olden days, you know, if they, they oh, probably there are some cases like uh, that today. You know, when you didn't pay your debt, they send in somebody to just torture you. And that was precisely what, you know, this is about. So if we don't want to forgive, then the enemy has a legal right to come and torment you and torment you and torment you. As believers of our covenant with God, we have to understand this. Um, it's, it's, it's a very powerful revelation that I got, you know, that really changed the way I, I, I treat the body of Christ, you know, in, in, a, in a greater way. Um, you see, as believers, of our, as believers, our covenant with God means that automatically any believer who is covenant with God, we are in covenant with. Any believer who is in covenant with God, we have automatically, that covenant is between us also. Let me, let me explain. When Cain told God he was not his brother's keeper, he did not see that covenantal relationship that he has with his brother, Abel. As believers, we are God's family. Now, this is where I want to illustrate about the covenant. As believers, we all become part of God's family. We are members of the body of Christ. How are we in covenant with one another? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body, the different parts of the body. A hand cannot say to the eye, I don't need you. We're in covenant. We operate together for the health. When I understood that, I said, oh, oh. You know, you can, sometimes you can be taught, you know, read certain things, understand, but when a deeper revelation comes in, you said, wow, wow. First Timothy um, chapter 5 and then Titus 2, and th that whole chapter there, um, the two chapters, Paul exhorts the older men and older women to be an example to young people, okay? And be able to teach and care for the younger people with love like fathers and mothers. In the church, we will ha always have the old and the young and the very, very young. So to the younger people, Paul exhorts them to treat each other as brothers and sisters. Now, with the elderly, the younger people are exhorted to treat them with respect and count those, especially those who labor in God's word and teaching, with especially double honor. But unfortunately, this is what happened. Many believers, young and old, are biting and devouring one another because of offenses and unable to forgive. That's what's happening in church. Why? Because we forget that we are in covenant with one another. We are members of the body of Christ. We are in covenant with one another. If the... if. Well, I know it doesn't happen, but, well, maybe a hand will. If a hand keeps slapping the face for a long time because it doesn't like the face, eventually you're going to get hurt. So when all these things are happening, the biting and devouring of one another, then the fruit of long-suffering and loving kindness is not developed to maturity in the church. The covenant that we have with one another in Christ is stronger than family ties. Who, are, who will be our family in heaven? 
people will be our family. The ones in Christ. The ones who believe Christ. The ones who accepted the covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. So our covenant in Christ, you know, is stronger than family ties because it's sealed with the blood of Jesus. It's sealed with the blood of Jesus. So every broken relationship affects our covenant with God and one another. We can leave church. We can ignore the one who wronged us. We don't want to look at their face, you know. But it doesn't change the fact that we have broken our relationship with one another and ultimately with God. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. The true reconciliation is found only in Christ. You know, we, can, we cannot have everlasting solution and peace within us if we do not go and dwell in the presence of God, you know, in Christ. I have to... That is something we have to, you know, discipline ourselves, you know, when we are hurting. We have to go to the presence of God. The world, and many of us in church too, you know, um, try to solve problems through all kinds of philosophies, talks, and actions. You know, read all these different books, you know. Step one, this is how you make peace with one another. Step two, and on and on and on and on and on. You know, a lot of this philosophy, it may work outwardly. But it does not deal with what goes on on the spirit, in the spirit and the soul of man. And therefore, peace will never be everlasting. Look at what is going on in the Middle East. They've been trying that for years. Years and years. And look at all the different situations about tribes. For years and years, certain tribes keep fighting. Because every... A lot of the solution came from outside. I can't remember, but there's this one wonderful uh, testimony, you know. But I, I won't quote that because I don't really remember exactly what it is. But it, it, this tribe, once it laid a hold of what Jesus did, you know, the reconciliation that only comes to Christ, you know, there was, there was um, the, the two different tribes were able to reconcile. And it was a reconciliation that, was lasting. That's a time ki kind of reconciliation that we want, you know, not temporary or face value kind. Um, so, all right. So when when we allow, when we run to God, you know, and we humble ourselves in the presence of God, we dwell in His presence and let God do the work that He needs to do, so that we can be reconciled, you know, to Him. Because every time we sin. It doesn't matter if Adam wrong us. Every time there's a separation, you know, there, there is that separation with God too, in a sense. So we need to run to God. And so when we run to God, if we are at fault also, he will show us. Because sometimes people are, have wronged you, maybe partly because you have also done something wrong. So let God you know, by his spirit begin to show you. Now, if, if you are not at fault, but yet you continue to yield and humble yourself, then the Holy Spirit in either case will be able to develop the fruit of long-suffering and loving kindness. So by the time you leave the church today, you will keep hearing this word, long-suffering, loving kindness, long-suffering, loving kindness. <laughs> so 
first uh, Colossians chapter 20, the, the verse that we have read, it says that Jesus reconciles all things to himself and brings peace through his blood. So that's true reconciliation. So our confidence, regardless of what people have done to us or wronged us, when we choose to accept reconciliation, we are reconciled to God through Christ and the gift of peace of the Holy Spirit will be given to you. In that way, you are experiencing the newness of life in reconciliation in Christ. You have passed from death that have enshrouded you, you know, of unforgiveness to newness of life in Christ. To summarize, let us choose God's ways in forgiveness. Partaking of Christ's suffering, we experience the glory of the risen Lord. And true lasting liberty on the inside to forgive is found only in Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And we do, when we do it God's way, we will experience the newness of life in reconciliation in Christ, even if the other party didn't choose to reconcile. Hallelujah. This is the glory.